what really impressed me about the uh, the Chinese Japanese poetry, which in many respects was Zen poetry, was that there was a sense of the uh, the ordinary uh, that there was something marvelous and transcendent in ordinary perceptions and ordinary experience. Hey everyone, it's Raghu back with Mind Rolling and uh, I have a wonderful new guest. I just said, well, we're going to get to know each other by virtue of this podcast. Uh, Hosan Alan Sinaki. Alan, Hosan, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Raghu. It's good to be here yeah. with you and your invisible Zoom audience. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, no, we're, we're going to have this to our... Ram Dass's Be Here Now Network audience. Ah, oh, great. Okay. Yeah. Um, and Hosan is the abbot of Berkeley Zen Center, and he's been engaged in Buddhism for, for decades. Uh, and you also run the Clear View Project, supporting humanitarian yeah. projects in a Asia, which we can talk about later. And, of course, author of multiple books and uh, this one, new one is called Turning Words, Transformative Encounters with Buddhist Teachers. And I love stories that account, uh, recount experiences with uh, great teachers. So that it was up my alley. Well, thank you. I enjoyed sort of reflecting on them and drawing them out of my mind and putting them onto paper. Mm. Some of them I'm very familiar with, and uh, we can talk about that too. But first off, can you just tell me your story a little bit? I mean, coming up as, uh, through childhood into teenagehood sure. and, you know, what were the things that led you to believe perhaps I am not my mind and my emotions and my senses? And there might be a way to be happy. Well, um, I grew up in the suburbs of New York. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I grew up in the 50s and the 60s. And as I, a high school student, I started reading Chinese and Japanese poetry. <laughs> and, and what, I, and beat poetry. Right. Uh, and what really impressed me about the uh, the Chinese Japanese poetry, which in many respects was Zen poetry, was that there was a sense of the uh, the ordinary uh, that there was something marvelous and transcendent in ordinary perceptions and ordinary experience. And I intuited some connection with that myself. Uh, and uh, I was reading that. Uh, I then, when I went to college, I studied writing with a wonderful uh, poet, who was a teacher, uh, Kenneth Koch. Uh, and also, like other children of my generation, uh, did a fair amount of psychedelic exploring. Mm -hmm. And that also was looking at the transcendent in the very ordinary. So there was a, and, and actually the orientation that we were taught in, uh, we were taught poetry and literature from was, was very similar and parallel. And so all these things were really of a piece for me. Uh, and it was in the summer of 1968, which was actually in the aftermath of the Columbia strike, uh, Columbia University strike, which I took part in. 
I lived in the president of the university's office for a week. <laughs> I was beaten and arrested. Oh. And we were pretty fried from that whole experience. And a group of us decided we were going to go to California. Uh, and so we went to California in driveway cars. And when we got to Berkeley, uh, we had already read read Philip Capo's book, Three Pillars of Zen, which was really the first book, I think, that conveyed that Zen was not a point of view. It was something you actually had to do with your body. Uh, hmm. and, and so we thought, okay, let's find a place to practice Zen. And we did. We started practicing at the Berkeley Zen Center, and we would go over uh, every week or so to San Francisco Zen Center at the time. Uh, and we did that over the course of the summer when we were in uh, California. And went back to New York. I had the intention of continuing to practice, and I started studying Japanese and had this idea about going to Japan and it kind of it kind of evaporated in the uh in the kind of fierceness and uh smoke and mirrors of the political climate of the of the times in the late 60s early 70s and so that that kind of receded into the background uh, until really I I kind of hit a wall with political action in the late 70s, early 80s and felt like I had run out of script for my life. And at that point, I began to wonder what to do. I was in psychotherapy hmm. and uh, I asked my therapist uh, what am I doing here on the planet? And she said, that's not a psychotherapeutic question. That's a spiritual question. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay. <laughs> and that's when I think the seed that had been planted in the late 60s germinated. And I started looking around for uh, a place to pick up that uh, practice and it happened I was back in Berkeley so I went to the Berkeley Zen Center and when I walked in there I was home mm. and everything unfolded from that mm. amazing and also what unfolded at that point was a perception that the world of social and political action and the world of uh, Buddhist practice were not necessarily two completely distinct realms. There were there were people who I respected who were really looking at the confluence of those things, and uh, that kind of revolved around the Buddhist Peace Fellowship, and so that was also uh, just a really pivotal part of my of my development. Mm. Yeah. And you talk about, uh, some of the people that influence you that yeah. way, but uppermost. And for many of us, of course, Thich Nhat Han emblemized that, uh, those meeting rivers of, uh, practice and taking whatever it is that, uh, embodied itself in you and mm -hmm. sharing it outwardly. Uh, in the world in whatever way uh, you were suited for. So, yeah, that's uh, and it's a big part of our lineage too, which is I think you're from you're obviously familiar with Ram Dass and and uh, sure. yeah. those those of us that went and met Neem Karoli Baba back in the in the day. I went to Berkeley too in 68. I'm just thinking you're talking about Berkeley in 68. Shit, I was there. I didn't see you though. <laughs> no. 
Uh, it's, it's uh, yeah, that migration. Mine was from Montreal. Yeah. Some of it was just to get warm. I thought I got to get to well, California. Yeah. I mean, California was the place to be. Yeah. yeah now, really now my kids who grew up in Berkeley, they went back east to go to school. Really? Yeah. But now, so but now one of them's back here and one of them made it at least as far west as Chicago. <laughs> Ouch. Chicago. Oh, boy. Um, you know what I'd like to hear you, uh, I mean, for all of us, when in that period of time and searching, using psychedelics, yeah. finding stories of the East, um, we were ultimately connected with a being, a teacher that would be a guiding light mm -hmm. to that place in each of us that we wanted to uh, f flourish. We wanted to flourish. I think that's a good word. Right. And, um, and uh, you know, for me, of course, initially it was Ram Dass, but then I, when I met Neem Karoli Baba, I understood what Ram Dass was all about. And then suddenly yeah. I was in the presence of uh, someone who had, gone beyond polarization inside themselves. There was no more me, you, or any of that. Yeah, and that's someone I wish I had encountered, you yeah, Ali Baba. Yeah, yeah, it was quite incredible. Um, I actually just uh, got off of a, a Zoom seminar with a bunch of, you know, about 500 people taking a course that was derived that we put out as part of Love, Serve, Remember Foundation, a 21-day mm -hmm. uh course based on Ram Dass's Be Here Now book, the cookbook for for uh, sacred mm -hmm. living. And mm -hmm. so I was going through all of that and, well, my God, look what he did way back then, you know, give mm -hmm. people a roadmap like that. Um, but they asked me about Neem Karoli Baba and what was it like and, and all of that. And, uh, you know, it's it's so great to be put in, you know, to be queried like that and then fall into that space you know so uh, magnificently by which the indelible times were are, are so present on a day-to-day -day basis and i wanted to ask you the same with um you know meeting your teacher sojun mel mm -hmm. weitzman who i i know of i never had the fortune to meet him but uh, can you talk about him and how that evolved and, you, you know, and that yeah, relationship? Well, it was very interesting because it happens that when I came to Berkeley to, to when my practice really began in the, in the late eighties, he was in Japan. And so I didn't encounter him. I encountered his community. Uh, and I felt very at home there. And then a month or two later, he, he returned. Uh, he was receiving Dharma transmission, sort of full authorization as a, as a priest and teacher from uh, Hoitsu Suzuki, who was Shunryu Suzuki Roshi's son. Mm. And when Sojin came back, it's like, oh, now I understand uh, how this all fits together. You know, there's a mandala in which he's sitting at the center, but he's not sitting at the center in, as some great force field. There's just things mysteriously happen around him that pull the community together. And uh, I observed that. And as I wrote in the book, you know, I had to go through the phase where I discovered uh, this person was not my father. Mm. He was not my psych, my uh, psychotherapist. He was not my friend. He was uh, my Buddhist teacher, which was something that, you know, was a new experience. It was something else. Uh, and in a peculiar way i've had an unusually orthodox uh training in that i live very close in 
you know, virtually in daily contact with my teacher for nearly 40 years. This is very unusual in, in this country. And, you know, that was wonderful. Sometimes it was hard. Uh, you know, uh, and he was, he was, I think I read about this in a couple of places in the book. He was profoundly ordinary, but very wise. And we're, we're, we've put together, there's a book of his coming out, uh, by the end of this year from Counterpoint Press, uh, his memoir for reflections on different parts of his life and also then a collection of his talks. And when I read those talks, I realize it's like we were in the presence of such a balanced kind of wisdom. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, deeply ordinary. Uh, from my mind, and you should excuse me, uh, he was not what one uh, he was not what one would ordinarily think of as a you know some remarkably charismatic figure uh, and but that really suits me that again goes back to this this issue of the transcendent in the ordinary uh and and that was what it was when i list when i read his talks i see such wisdom there and the wisdom that he had was in many ways a direct transmission from his teacher from shunryu suzuki roshi whom i never met and must have been a very strong teacher i mean i know he was because his words still resonate with us but you know people did not have a lot of time with him you know he sojin was around him from about 65 until um suzuki roshi died in 71 mm. so sojin roshi is really the touchstone for all of this can you relate something of your exchange with him to give a yes taste of that relationship? Yeah. Um, when I began to practice, and I was about 35 when I came here the second time. Um, and, you know, I fell into the practice really directly and pretty intensively. Uh, and I discovered that I was very taken with and interested in the various liturgical forms and Zendo forms that we had. And I wanted to do everything perfectly. And not only did I want, did I want to do things perfectly, I wanted everybody around me to do things perfectly, <laughs> you know, be, and I think that there was a sense of, there was a sense of anxiety that I had about trying to hold this spinning world together, uh, which meant that everything had to be in its right place. Mm. Um, he watched me for about a year and didn't say anything. And then one day in uh, Doksan, which is private interview between teacher and student, he just out of the blue said, you should let things fall apart. Hmm. And that was, that was just a, a riveting message. And also, it was uh, a koan or a conundrum, if you will, that stays with me. Um, yes, first of all, I have to accept, and there's another teacher, let me just recount something else that he, one, one day, and this is considerably later, you know, he was saying, 
everything is going so well around here. And we should remember it could just go like that in a moment. And, you know, it was a few years later, the pandemic happened. That's exactly what happened, right? You know, all the, all of the forms, all the structures of practice that we had, uh, in that moment disappeared and we had to start from scratch. Um, so the conundrum is that things will fall apart. And you and I know this as we get older, right? Uh, and they will fall apart. And yet, and so you can't resist that. But at the same time, what is the, what is the, the mind that is stable, that is stable through the change and the transitions? Uh, and, you know, we have to, Determine this for ourselves. Mm, yeah. So whatever he said, you know, every teaching from anybody to me is a kind of medicine or it's something that is designed not abstractly, but very particularly to bring one back into balance. And so for him to tell me you should let things fall apart, he was, he was, what he was really good at always was if you brought up one side, he would bring up the other. And he would remind you that there were different sides and aspects to things, to people and to actions and to things. And it's, really important to keep your mind open to to all of those facets of existence yeah you know um, i read one part of the book where you talked about your dad mm -hmm. and it's this this is sort of a little bit uncanny actually um and he asked you are you happy Right. And you said, well, being happy is not important. I want to be of use. That's how I want to live. And this brought up for me, my father mm -hmm. came to India in that day to meet Neem Karoli Baba. Uh, I was at odds with him. And it wasn't sort of, I got the letter. I was telling, oh, wow, you can't believe how great we're with this being and blah, blah. But I never for one second expected him to fly from Montreal to Delhi to actually go through back in the day. It's still not that easy to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and he did it. And he ended up with Maharaji. Um, and myself, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and Maharaji says to him, why did you come here? And he said, well, I, I came to see how my sons were doing. My brother was there with me. And he said, well, how are they doing? He said, well, they seem to be happy. And Maharaji <laughs> said, happiness is everything. And in that moment, or what I recall of that moment, it was about not happy, happy, we're going to go out and do stuff to make us happy, happy. It was about true, deep contentment with what is and being in the moment. And so uh, at the same time, of course, and this is a famous story, <laughs> uh, later on, not later on, meeting a week later somewhere else, we were with him. 
and uh, Neem Karoli Baba, you know, asked me if I give my father uh, medicine. I said, yeah, I know he had a cold. I gave him some aspirin. He said, no, the yogi medicine that Ramdas gave me. I went, acid? My dad? And my father went LSD. And he said, Maharaj, he said, take care of your father while he's in India and meet me in two weeks. And sure enough, we ended up in Benares where people, you know, thousands of years ago to die in, in the burning gods there. And I found him a hit of acid. He took it. He was a World War II fighter. I've told this story a million times, but I got to tell it to you because it's relevant. With I think our fathers, it's very relevant. He was a fighter pilot, a bomber pilot in the war, and and uh, he had bad PTSD. I mean, so mm -hmm. bad he was he he thought he wasn't afraid to die. I mean, you know, he had he could, dreams he could not remember or recall any of them. You know, he was really closed off. Anyhow, this this acid uh, was like uh, somebody, uh, well, in this case, Neem Karoli Baba, tossed a stick of dynamite on him, and poof, from then on, we had an incredible, uh, uh, I mean, we still fought at times, but it was profoundly converted and transformed relationship as a result of that. Well, that's a really interesting story, and... In the, uh, the summer of 1967, mm. uh, I think a year before that, we had started taking LSD. Uh, my father and uh, his second wife came to New York. This is before the story that's recounted in my book, which is a little a couple of years later. Uh, and he noticed that I was different than I had been. And he wanted to know why. Mm. And I said, well, uh, I would ascribe that to uh, what we've been doing with LSD. And then I said, would you like to try some? <laughs> Which <laughs> is a mind-boggling thing, but that's how, that's how how out there all of us were at that point, right? Uh, and he did. Really? Yes. And wow. we we had a day, we had quite a marvelous day together. You took it as well? Yeah. And it's just the two of you? Just the two of us in my apartment on 119th Street. <laughs> and... Yeah. You know, and we walked around, but mostly what we did was we told stories of our lives really? and uh, kind of like a A B reflection of what was I doing? How did he perceive that? What was oh, he doing? How did wow. I perceive that? Uh, and it was it was a wonderful opening. And I'm sorry to say, I think it scared him. Oh, and but during the trip he was fine, and he, you were during the trip he was really completely open. Wow. Uh, and but I think that the experience of it that the intimacy of that moment was was never uh, never repeated, which is very sad. Mm. But I do think in the story that I told about where he asked me, are you happy? He was onto something. He understood something fundamental that I was not ready to understand about the utility of happiness. Mm. And, what do you, you mean know, by that? What I mean was. If you can't touch a kind of fundamental or elemental happiness or contentment in your life, then your sense of being useful, uh, your, your compulsion to be useful will never be accomplished mm. Mm. 
it 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 is its own bottomless hunger. Right, hungry ghost. Yeah, I mean, and I think that Buddhism plays with that dynamic tension, particularly Zen, Mahayana. Uh, you know, if we think about the Bodhisattva vows, beings are numberless, I vow to save them. That's impossible. Uh, the sixth ancestor, and that's also in my book, said, Beings are numberless. Beings of my sentient beings of my mind are numberless. I vow to save them. And that's taking care of all of your states of mind and facing your states of mind with an attitude of loving kindness and acceptance and appreciation. And at the same time, not letting them run the show. That is so hard for people. It's hard, but that's our practice. That's but, why I said it's a dynamic, it's it's a dynamic tension, right? Yeah. But loving in order to do that, you have to have a steadiness. So mm. for example, the you mm. know, one of the there are many images of Avlokiteshvara or Kuan Yin, uh, uh, the Bodhisattva of compassion. And one of them is, you know. One one of them is his slash her head split into four or eleven visages because she's seeing the cries of the world from every direction. Another image is her sitting in what's called royal the posture of royal ease. You know, taking in this suffering with wisdom with uh, an acceptance and a readiness to move and act mm. Mm. the difficulty that is so widespread people can get down with compassion and altruism but not towards themselves well that's a problem in the west yeah you know, I mean, it's interesting because the there's really basic meditation approach that uh, people learn in uh, certainly in Theravada Buddhism, but also also in, in all kinds of Buddhism of uh, metta practice, uh, metta bhavana, loving kind practice of loving kindness, uh, and it's an ancient practice. You know, I'm sure that it predates Buddhism. Uh, but the traditional map of metta practice begins, it, it goes from, theoretically, it goes from the easiest kind of practice to the hardest kind mm. of practice. Mm. And at least in that framework, the easiest kind of practice is, you know, you extend loving kindness to yourself. That's where you start. That's really hard for, for us in the West. You know, that's maybe the hardest. We have, you know, such self-punishing, such, you know, uh, there's a kind of, there's a woundedness that we carry mm. that probably has much to do with our various histories. You know, each, many of cultures that are here uh, have a background of, of deep wounds. And our nation has a background of deep wounds. Um, at any rate, the, the, the self conception I think there's something different about self conception in, in the West than than in than in some cultures in the East. Yeah. Yeah, I've experienced it myself. I mean there's that great story, I'm not quite sure I know that remember exactly what his holiness said, but when 
he was told, you, you understand, <laughs> we people here, we have a lot of, of self-hatred and, and questioning and, and so on. I mean, he, he was like, really? You know, it was something new to yeah. him. This is way, way back when. Yeah, I, I, I've heard that story. Yeah, yeah. It's an amazing thing. Um, yeah, I, 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 I often wonder... And it's not, you know, and I used to think sometimes, well, you know, maybe a lot of this has to do with, you know, in terms of what's going on in this country and the polarization and, and the kind of uh, transference that happened when this country was populated by people from um, Western Europe and uh, and the morals and the mores of these people were, were really st- Strictly put onto the populace, and as that karma went down the line, that contributed to uh, the um, this this kind of woundedness that that you spoke of, which is is so extraordinarily prevalent. Look what is going on all the way down to the youth right now. Uh, you know, taking their lives, teenagers. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it's become endemic. And it's gotten a lot worse, but I don't know if that's the reality. I don't. It's it's hard to say. You know, there's um, there's a text, there's a commentary in one of the early sutras where the Buddha says uh, about the workings of karma, which are problematic to us in in a lot of ways. One thing he says is, if you try to understand the roots and sources of of karma, you'll go crazy. Mm. You know, and so in our uh, our ceremonies of repentance and renewal, we talk about all, all my ancient twisted karma from beginningless greed, hate, and delusion. And the i think the thrust of karma for me uh, in in a buddhist notion of karma is not where does it come from but what are you going to do now with what spirit and with what energy what's the next step you're going to take which allows for the transformation of karma not why did this happen to me or what mm-hmm. went on back mm-hmm. there. Yeah. You know, it's like, so, so for, for me, uh, you know, I, I think I've done a lot of work in Burma and in India, working with the democracy movement of Burma, working with untouchable communities in India And, you know, when I wonder, I do reflect, why am I drawn to this? And, you know, I realize, well, uh, not more than, not much more than a hundred years ago, my grandparents also, and their parents came here fleeing violence and oppression. Mm. And so that's in my karma. And the question is not, how do I wallow about in, say, the, the hereditary suffering of being, of being born Jewish, but it's like, how do I move forward to benefit people Yeah, with joy? Yeah. You know what I love? Uh, Katagiri Roshi. I don't, I, I'm not familiar with him. But um, but I you know in reading uh, know that uh, he helped uh, Suzuki Roshi build the Zen Center in San Francisco. Yeah. yeah. Um, who I was, of course, as many of us were in those days and now, very familiar with. And uh, but I like what he said: Karma is volitional action, which always has a fruit or a result. And then you say, then he was silent before beginning again. Rebirth is, 
and quiet. Rebirth means a little more silence. He sat there with a look of perplexity on his face. At last he said, I'm sorry. I cannot talk about this or explain it to you. The problem is, I believe and you do not. <laughs> yeah. Well, wow, that's moment. Is, yeah, that that is a moment and a half. Yeah. I believe, but you do not. Um, well, I think many people uh, uh, like us that have been on the path for a while or even people not on the path that long but are very committed practitioners and understand uh, the, the need for, not understand the need, are, are pushed to follow a way that will, as you have been saying, create a balance in our lives that uh, we have not had. And, um, you know, it's like anything, I think, that the idea of karma and re reincarnation, I think it can be, uh, I, I mean, there are solid ideas that can be um, explicated to some degree, certainly by a great teacher. Uh, by a, a, I mean, we have a, a friend, uh, Dr. Robert Svoboda, I don't know if you know who Robert is. He's a, yeah, he's a, a wonderful Ayurvedic uh, doctor as well as completely steeped in the Hindu tradi tradition in the Vedas and so on. And uh, he had also somebody, a teacher in India who is an Aghori, which is uh, you know a, a very um, called the left hand of God kind of sect. They they did really extraordinarily. Um, unusual, shall we say, meditating on corpses, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, really out there. And for the most part, they are in India still, but many of them are, are not, shall I say, substantial, whereas this being was completely substantial. And uh, he wrote a, a trilogy of books about them, Robert did, um, around the Agori. And one of them was called, uh, the, the last one was called The Law of Karma. He got this download from this being. It was some of the best uh, edification of that subject that I had encountered. And I've always used it in terms of, you know, if you want to, people asking about that, well, take a look here because this will, this definitely points in what I believe is, is, you know, the right direction whatever that means but it was substantial and and uh you know of course it encompasses rebirth now uh, because of the being because of neem karoli baba and other beings that i bumped into back in that day i i feel like uh there is some substantial experiential thing going on here which which gives me real faith in in the reality and yet I tell people, listen, you're going to get whatever it is you need in every moment to allow you to get further and further into an understanding that's beyond rational mind. Mm -hmm. And this is grace. This is the grace of us as humans being here and being taken care of. And yeah, you know, it's it whether it's fully developed or not, you know. That's a whole other thing. But I love uh, Kadaguri Roshi saying the problem is I believe and you do not. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, my uh, Sojin Roshi, uh, two points. One is when he, when he was asked about rebirth, uh, his response was often, I don't remember. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's and, great. Um but I think that the perspective and this goes to this is this goes to at least my interpretation of that Bodhisattva valve, the sixth ancestor, the sentient beings of my mind are numberless. Mm. Uh and I think the perspective often in Soto Zen is about moment to moment rebirth. Mm. That on a momentary basis, according to what we might call, you know, our emotional state, you can think of each emotional state as a being. 
And so you think of a Buddhist cosmology, you think of the, the six realms of that are kind of the map of Buddhist cosmology, the human, God, uh, fighting demon, uh, hungry ghosts, mm. hell beings, and animals. Uh, and when you look at the wheel of, of becoming, there's one sitting right here next to my desk. Uh, those are the six realms that are depicted, but they really are just symbolic of countless realms. And, you know, we, we, in, we experience a flow of emotional states in the, in the course of a day in which we are at least in one sense, reborn. And we can be reborn in, in those in any of those realms or countless others very finely gradated. Uh, and each one of those that's that's a being that's born, we have to take care of them. We have to hold them compassionately. Uh, and if you do that, then they live their natural lifespan and they're born and they pass away. And in the next emotional state, another being is born. So that's that's the perspective that I've had communicated to me uh, mm. uh, by many of my Zen teachers. Mm. Yeah, that's great. Which doesn't negate doesn't negate a a larger arc of rebirth. Um, but it, it's helpful to, to actually think of one's life that way. Mm. Yeah, that's, uh, Ramdas would talk about, we as humans can live on more than one plane of consciousness at the same time. Yeah. You know, that yeah. speaks that. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I want to read something. Hose on. Uh, then you can comment on it. It's something from uh, Maha Goshananda that oh, yeah. I read in the book that I really, really love. Life is eating and drinking through all of our senses, and life is keeping from being eaten. What eats us? Time. What is time? Time is living in the past or living in the future, feeding on the emotions. Beings who can say that they are mentally healthy for even one minute are rare in this world. Ouch. Eh? Oi. Most of us suffer from clinging to pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral feelings, and from hunger and thirst. Most living beings have to eat and drink every day, every, rather every second through their eyes, ears, nose, tongue, skin, and nerves. We eat 24 hours a day without stopping. We crave food for the body, food for feeling, food for volitional action, and food for rebirth. We are what we eat. We are the world, and we eat the world. Time is also an eater. In traditional Cambodian stories, there is often a giant with many mouths who eats everything. This giant is time. If you eat time, you gain nirvana. You can eat time by living in the moment. When you just live in this moment, time cannot eat you. Also harks to Ramdas's be here now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's so, so great, though. What a remarkable person. And there's a person who was full of joy. Yeah. Despite all that he had seen, you know, he's somebody who appeared to everybody to walk about an inch above the ground. I feel so fortunate to have to have met him. Mm. Yeah, that's so great. I'm going to need to, first of all, my, the battery is going down and also I'm going to need to leave in a few minutes. Well, we're just about done. I'm okay. glad I got in that last little uh, piece. Yeah, uh, me too. It just, you know, the confession is I haven't reread this book yet. 
No. <laughs> it's like you bring up says that, oh, you know, that's oh, cool. So that, that's in there. That that's really meaningful to me. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. I'm glad we did that. Uh, I also want to say we have somebody in common that uh, is very dear to me, and I know you as well, and that's Roshi Halifax, Roshi Joan Halifax. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, she was a very close friend of Ram Dass's and spent a lot of time with him and all that. And I even have a, a good friend who is part of this chaplaincy that she does, uh, Roshi does, that you, because I mentioned her, her name is Danielle Credic Ananda. Oh, I don't know her. Uh, yeah, she's she's quite great. Anyhow, she's taking this and um, mentioned that she was, and she said, yeah, and I had, there was this Zen teacher that came on and talked about ritual, something I never really was into, you know, and and he just turned me around, and I thought, yeah, of course, if Roshi had him, I said, he's going to, I'm doing a podcast with him tomorrow. Isn't That's that great. crazy? Yeah, so, <laughs> so she's in She's in the new cohort. That's why I don't know. I'm just going uh-huh, to yeah. them. Yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, we had, we had uh, several live sessions, you know, video yeah. sessions with, with Ram Dass. It, they were just remarkable. Mm. Oh, that's so great. And, yeah, I've been working with Roshi Joan for, I don't know, 12 years now. Oh, really? Yeah. Part of that, part, part of that program. Uh, yeah, that's great. I'm grateful I mean, for that. Yeah, and, and she, when we talk about, you know, the combination of doing the work for ourselves as well as the Bodhi, uh, you know, for Bodhicitta, Bodhicitta, yeah. and as well as, you know, this is not for selfishly for us. This is about what for everyone. Right. Right. And that message is, is, you know, it's what we embodied hopefully after we left India all those years ago and, and have spent time, you know, developing. Well, I think you guys have. Yeah. Yeah. No, very fortunate. So great to meet you. You oh, too. God. I hope we'll be, uh, let's stay in touch. You know, absolutely, absolutely. And and, and by the way, everybody, we're going to have, uh, just go to the show notes. This is Mind Rolling okay. Be Here Now Network, and you'll be able to link up with uh, Hosan's book and, uh, and, you know, the work he does at the Zen Center in the Bay Area, Berkeley. And, uh, yeah, it's something everybody should have a little bit of an experience with because it's... Uh, it's quite a practice. So thank you again, Hosan. And thank you I, so much, Rago. Yeah, and we'll we'll catch up with you next time. Let's do that. Yeah. Okay. Be well. Bye.